Welcome into UGA Football Live with J.C. Shelton, where the dogs come to talk. All right, everybody, welcome in UGA Football Live with J.C. Shelton and former Georgia tight end Arthur Lynch. We've got a really special guest for you guys today, first time on the show. Already he's been several times. This is our first time we get Chris Conley on the show, former Georgia wide receiver, NFL pro for nine seasons now. Really impressive by him and one of my favorite players when I was younger um, watching and then that prolific offense you guys had. And I really want to start this with letting Artie and Chris catch up a little bit. Um, I've heard they were the dynamic duo. I know we know, I know we know saw it on Saturdays, but Artie said you guys had some really interesting conversations after practice. Um, and that shows us a little bit about how you guys worked and, and that camaraderie of that group. Um, Chris, Artie, what was that first time like? Let's just bring us back to when y'all first met um, and what y'all been up to now. Y'all stay in touch or what? Man. Yeah, well, well, let me uh, – there's uh, – I'll start it with saying that when you get the opportunity to play any sport at any sort of level, like you could be very pigeonholed um, in terms of the types of personalities that – you're surrounded with right and right, wrong, and different. But it's just kind of the way it is because you're all one track mind. But for me, I was always super intrigued by meeting different types of people from different types of places who had different types of interests, right? And I think, and, I, and I'll pitch this to Chris here in a second. But one of the things I loved about Chris, and ironically, I was talking to my mom earlier today because she was she got friendly with Christina, who's Mrs. Conley, um, and which I think is is a testament to. Chris and I's friendship and their friendship is I was I always valued Chris's intent in everything that he did, particularly intellectually, right? And and one thing that I always loved about Chris and and, and what I appreciate is we would spend, you know, sometimes a half hour, 45 minutes out of practice, just sitting in the locker room talking about everything under the sun, but nothing to do with football. And conversation via politics about student athletes about the opportunity to maybe one day at least be getting paid um and you know with that chris i'll throw it to you but to me one of the things that i always cherished still to cherish to this day is the conversations that i was able to have with chris and the friendship that was formed over those conversations yeah no i um i uh just remember college was such a cool time to be around so many different types of people uh, from so many different backgrounds and and I feel like it was just like an an awesome place to just gather information and to get to know people and uh, and really like those were the moments that I feel like made us better as a team you know because we 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 knew guys like we got to know each other so well that it was really easy for me to go out on the field and you know fight for you you know when I wasn't feeling you know I was tired or I was sore or I was late in the fourth quarter, man. Like you really go out there and you like lay it on the line for, for those people that you can, you know, you hear it all the time, lay it on the line for your brothers, lay it on the line. But I mean, there's a real sense of that, especially in college when you spend every day with each other for years, you know, I spent more time around you uh, than some of than my family, you know, at that point. Totally. And so, um, I just remember you know, you and, and the older guys, uh, the way that you like welcomed us in, you know, uh, I think that at first there's a little bit of that. I, and I, I use the term hazing lo- very loosely because I don't even think it was that bad when, when I was going into school and it's much less now, like there's none of that stuff happens anymore. And so I'm like, where do they like, like, come on, man, you got to like initiate people. But, um, I just remember, uh, the way that you guys, uh, made sure that we knew that we were not the top dogs anymore when we came in uh, and, and really tried to and helped us refocus uh, that this was going to be a grind. But then after that, it was all love, man. It was all love. It was all brotherhood. And, and y'all really accepted us in and we became dogs, you know, and it's something that I'll, I'll never forget, you know, in my life. Some of, some of the best um, lessons and memories uh, have come from that stage in my life. Cause like when you're a freshman in college, you're impressionable. You're very mm-hmm. impressionable. And the cool thing about my experience is I was around, you know, good people 
like yourself, but not only just good people, but good people who were okay with, you know, it not being all about ball. And uh, that was something that I needed because I, I couldn't have it be all about ball because ball was so new, you know, at that point. So. Yeah, one thing I think one of the one of the questions, JC, was one of the first memories I had of Chris, right? And we used to do these by the time Chris came, which was 2011 summer, if, I, if I'm remembering correctly. Coach T had already taken over, from my understanding, at that point in the in the uh, strength and conditioning program. We would do these like our conditioning test was 16 300 meters and there was really only one dude that could really just like leg leg these things out and look like a gazelle running them and just look look like he should be on the track team and that was tk and then the only other person i saw after tk be able to just be like man that dude should just go run track for us because it was like and again i say this like you know it, it was a beautiful thing to watch so I say that in confidence, in, in comfortable in my own skin saying it, but I'd be like, whoever this kid is, man, that dude can stretch it out. So my first memory of Chris, just like that is ingrained in my mind before those conversations used to be had, I was like, I was like, well, we got a, we got TK 2.0, except he's built like a brick shit house because TK he ain't built like Chris. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> and so that was my first memory. Um, but I, but I think when you talk about that that process of being initiated, if you will, it's like I think we come from an era that may or may not still be around. But you got to be humbled, no matter how good you are. You have to be humbled right away. And man, I was humbled for a couple of years because I had, I came in with Orson Charles, right, who was like a stud. And I think to Chris's credit, man, one thing I will always recall. Obviously, we talked about those three hundred meter sprints, but his his ability to just work right relentlessly and it and it's shown off here obviously going into year 10 in the league but whether it be mad drills whether it be those sprints whether it be on the practice field or off and obviously academically as well it's like you can tell early on kids who or players who are like oh he's gonna no matter what happens here at uga from like how much of a producer he ends up being in the field he's going to be an impactful player for this program because how he approaches the sport and the process and really the profession that is being a student athlete. And Chris was, just, obviously it, it, it's, it's come, come to fruition 10 times over, but I think we all knew pretty early on that Chris was, was going to be a guy. Yeah, yeah. I appreciate that. And, you know, growing up for me, Georgia fan, uh, most of my life before went to Georgia and then it just, you know, got, got much more in that ingrained in that. But um, I want to paint you guys a picture and for you at home as well. So, one of my first memories of Chris as well was 2013 summer, Mark Rick football camp. My ginger self in a cutoff Georgia shirt had no idea it was not in the indoor facility. It was like 98 degrees. We're out there in the morning. Um, you know, I, I've already had a sunburn 30 minutes into this Mark Rick camp. I'm in, I'm in ninth grade. Right. I'm going to see all these Georgia players around on Marlo Herrera, John Theus. I'm like, oh, this is awesome as a Georgia fan. All right. We get done with a couple hours of running. I am gassed. I'm running against these five star, four stars. I look like I do not belong. Um, and that's why I'm doing this, guys, and not playing on the field. But I take my my boiled skin in, in the indoor room. We're measuring hands at this point. OK. And none other than Chris Conley measured my hand. Uh, nine, nine inches guys. So I do have that going for, I have nine inches. I don't know what that ranks on the combine. Okay. Uh, it's not too bad. I mean, I had, I had Paul's guys. You're never going to see it. So I, this is, it's all I've got is just say it. But, uh, Chris, I think you did a great job there. I, I really do. Um, and you were nice about it. You could tell, Hey, this guy, he appreciates us working here. All right. And, and, and working our butts off to try to get a college career. Um, and with that said, Chris, also another thing, I would love for you to narrate my life at any, <laughs> if we could, if we could figure that out, the voice, the, the, I don't know if the mic is doing it too, but. Mic it, definitely helps. The mic definitely yeah. helps. Yeah. And I remember. No, man, this, is, this is Chris. This is Chris. He's been this way since he was 18, man. The three C's <laughs> yeah, cool, well, calm, and collective. Cool, calm, and collective. Quality man. mic will bring, it brings the voice through um, nicely. 
Yeah. What I want to know, upgrade. Chris, is how, how, how did you get to work the Mark Root camp? Did you get paid for it? Because I know for no. fact I didn't work no camp. To get paid uh, no, for it. I didn't. Um, I don't even know how I ended up at some of those camps. I don't know if I was asked by the coaches or if I saw stuff going on and I stopped by. But um, I feel like I always kind of ended up at the camps and and I feel like kids like wanted to to talk and, and have like a moment where they like could could meet people that they saw play, but they never really saw us with our helmets off kind of thing. And I, I didn't have anything else to do. You know, I, there was um I feel like there was a lot of time that I spent in in the facility or passing through there. And it was it was nice to to be out there on that field and see people on the same journey at a different stage. But I just remember myself, you know, when I was when I was doing everything in my power to figure out what football was and having no idea, you know, asking so many questions and watching so many other people and trying to emulate things and fail and try this and fail. But the, the constant was, I'm just gonna do it at hundred miles an hour, you know, mm-hmm. and uh, just trying to see and find out like how I can just become better. Uh, Cause I just, I feel like when I was my first couple of years in college, I, I honestly, that's when football was, was starting to make sense. You know, I started playing in high school and uh, I think that I remember each of those stops along the way. And it makes it a lot easier for me to like spend some time and talk to people who are on that journey as well, because it's unique, uh, but we all share it. Anyone who plays the game shares that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You talk about impressionable, like you said earlier, Chris, and that's, that reminds me of that, right? When you talked about seeing guys with their helmets off and you're a fan of the game, student of the game, you want to play one day in college. And I was just glued to you guys, the players at the time who were just took the time out to be at that camp. Like anything you said, I remember for, you know, years later, right? That's you're just trying to soak up everything. So I really appreciate that time. We'll get into Georgia here for you as well. Before before your 112 receptions and over 1,900 yards and fifth all-time reception touchdowns for Georgia, before all that, what was that recruiting process like for you? I like to do that for the first time, dogs on the show, and just learn about that process for you before you ultimately chose the dogs. Yeah, you know, for me – um, I was able to go into the recruiting process with like an unadulterated mind. Like I didn't know football. And when I say I didn't know football, I don't think people really understand, you know, I went to high school in Georgia, but I did not grow up in Georgia. I was not born in Georgia. So uh, college football and the religion that is football, I had no reference of. So I didn't know conferences. I didn't know schools. I didn't know powerhouses. I didn't know, well, these schools are known for these kinds of players. I didn't know any of that. So I was going in completely blind. I was giving Georgia just as fair of a shake as I was giving Vanderbilt, you know, and uh, going into a lot of these schools, I obviously began to notice that, yeah, okay, there's some, some programs that seem like they have more support for players. That's obvious. You know, that's something that you could see the disparity between facilities and uh, recovery equipment and things like that was was apparent, but I think the biggest thing that stood out for me and really made me pause when it came to Georgia was the fact that it felt like a home. And some of the other large universities that I visited um, did not, did not. So, um, you know, I, my top three were Georgia, Alabama, and Clemson. And the thing about Alabama and Clemson, and this is no, you know, this is no shade on them. Some people love this about those places, but there were so many people so much support staff i feel like they had 20 trainers they had 15 people working in nutrition they had like 30 weight coaches because it was so detailed there were so many people who were individualized for each player and i think that that was great but for me i felt overwhelmed at the point where i was learning really i was going somewhere to learn football and for me i felt more comfortable because georgia felt like home it felt more personal uh i i feel like i knew the people well i feel like they knew me they knew my family uh and then also uh another thing that stood out to me was the fact that coach rick would take the time before my first georgia camp he took the time uh just basically to pray that no one would get hurt in the camp and just taking that time to have that thought for each of the players 99 percent of which will never play at georgia you know and i think of the other top recruiting talent that was there out of them maybe 
you know, 20% of them actually committed to Georgia. So even knowing that you weren't going to land these kids, but setting that kind of standard of saying like, hey, like this is what we're going to do first. Uh, and then going into everything, there was a consciousness and a care about everyone out there. And I appreciated that about Coach Rick, you know, um, in the way that he, you know, he carried himself. And that was really the first thing uh, in the story of what really built Coach Rick in my mind as I spent my four years there and the amount of respect that I have for him. Artie, do you have anything to say off of Mark right there? I know we talked about him a lot, and it feels like every Bulldog I've had on here, most of the guys are from that era. And they have nothing but good things to say about him. And it's it's really impressive that, you know, over the amount of time he was at Georgia, you know, because everybody makes mistakes. Everybody says some some things in life that they they don't mean or they wish they could take back. But it feels like for Mark Richt, everything is on the positive side and really looks back to you know his character and the way he coached you guys from, you know, an off field standpoint. Yeah, no, I think Chris hit the nail on the head. I think the, the, the thing that separates Coach Rick more so than any other, let's call it, like prominent football personality is what you see is what you get. And he is in there, he is incredibly authentic, right? The, his faith, he, his faith is authentic. Right. The example he sets is authentic. And, you know, I've actually in the past six months to a year, I've kept in contact with coach and, and, and just, you know, have reached out to him on a number of occasions to sh tell him how much I appreciate him. And, but one moment in time that kind of encapsulates who he is as a person was after the 2010 season. Chris, were you a mid year guy? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I came in in so January you, of 2011. So you may have been at this team meeting, but we had a team meeting. Um, we had just gone six and seven. Um, Justin Houston was leaving. Boykin was leaving, I think. Um, Justin Houston was leaving Boykin State. But regardless, we, we had gone six and seven. Coach, the Miami job came open. Coach Rick was offered a job at University of Miami. Um, he effect, you know, effectively turned it down, but he sat in front of us in the January team meeting and sat in the hot seat, right? And Chris knows what the hot seat is. I think everyone kind of knows what the hot seat is now. It's kind of an opportunity for any player to sit in front of the team and kind of speak their truth. Coach Rick sat down and he's like, I've been offered another job in Miami. You know, um, obviously I'm in this hot seat right now, but I'm in the general hot seat here at Georgia. And he just kind of spoke to us as men and was like, you know, raise your hand if you've been raised by a single parent or grandparents. Your your parents were kind of missing. And a lot of guys raised their hand. My dad left when I was young, so I raised my hand. And and he said something that was very poignant, very very, just Coach Rick esque. And he was like, "My job is not just to try to mold you into the best football players you can be and to win a national championship. It's to make sure that in ten, twenty. 30 years, your kids are not sitting in this room raising their hands because you failed them as fathers, right? And my job is to make sure you're good fathers, husbands, brothers, uncles, everything in the sun. And on top of that, you know, great football players. And that kind of hit home to me. Um, I, I talk about, and, and it's something that has been ingrained in my mind. And no one really talked about it after that, never hit the press. There was no stories of it. But that's just the type of guy Coach Rick is, right? Like his back was against the wall. He could have left all of us. And to be honest, I think most coaches probably would have to go back to their alma mater, a little bit more money, a little bit safer seat, less competition. But he stuck it out. And that's just the type of person that he is. The promises that he made to us and our families, at least for me, I can say wholeheartedly, he kept he kept those promises. Uh, he made those promises and kept them true. So. Chris is exactly right. He's just a, he's a hard guy not to want to play hard for because you know that he would give anything for you and for his, for all your teammates. Yeah, no, I think that the way that I talk to people when they ask me, what was Coach Rick really like? I say, Coach Rick is a true example of a coach who cares more about what his players will be as men than winning football games. And 
I wholeheartedly believe that, and I'm wholeheartedly thankful for that. I know there were a lot of fans who found fault with some of the decisions that he made because they're not good business decisions, but he wasn't a business person. He was a people person. And I am so thankful for that because to this day, I can look at guys, myself included, that were in our locker room who their lives would not be the way that they are right now, the men that they are, the families that they have right now, uh, and what they're what they're aiming to do and what they're doing is phenomenal. And it's and for some guys, I feel like it's a complete change uh, from who they were and who we were when we were kids. You know, he really helped us mm-hmm. point us in the direction uh, of the road less traveled and some things that were difficult, so that we could become men. And um, I'm really thankful for that. I feel more. like that's even less talked about now, too, you know, out, out of that era, out of the Mark Richter era. Like, who's that coach now? You know, I don't think one stands out in your mind, per se. Uh, I know Kirby Smart has a good reputation, at least with the players, for that. Um, but they're just – they're different guys. And you, you're not going to see Mark Rick throwing a uh, – throwing a uh, – what you call it? Headset 40 yards down the field either. Um <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's competitive though. He, like he <laughs> he's, a, competitive oh, he's very game. competitive. Right. Uh, very always- rarely, very rarely did coach lose his cool to the point where like it like shocked people. But when that happened, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you you need, you need to talk to Aaron Murray about uh, JC next time you see him because they would have those like quarterback games with the current quarterbacks and Brad Johnson and his son it's like Bobo would be there David Green and I've heard like you know chip tooth right in the, in the three on three basketball blood I mean coach Rick was he was a ruthless competitor he was just at peace with himself as well so he <laughs> keep that thing you know not many f-bombs coming from coach Rick let's just say that yeah yeah well speaking of feisty Chris I'm gonna get your thoughts on Mike Bobo as an yeah. OC, obviously back in the role now. I've heard a lot about him from Artie. I know his perspective. Um, kind of take us through your maybe first impression of him, and then after a few years, maybe what that was like. <laughs> yeah, first, impression. first impression. First impression of Coach Bobo is just abrasive. So, like, <laughs> when I remember, I remember getting there and being like, man, why did this guy recruit me if he hates me so much? Oh, and oh, I just sure. remember, like, like Coach Bobo said some things to me that made me question why I was playing football. <laughs> My first year, I mean, I got, especially in Matt Drills. Matt Drills was like his time where he was like, I'm going to push you as far as I legally can mentally to make you tougher. And I didn't understand that my first year. Uh, and I, I, I struggled with that because at first it felt personal. It felt personal. It felt it felt like I just did this rep just as well, if not better than everyone in my line. And you've sent me back three times creating some some false error that I made in my mat drill. And you're making all the guys on my line suffer because of me. And I had I had problems with that. And I think he knew that. And that's why he continued to do it. It was like this stubborn defiance in me of like, I can keep going and I'm going to beat you. And he was like, no, I'm going to beat you. And um, I struggled with that my first year. But as time went on, I realized that this was this was another instance of him molding people. You know, I couldn't take uh, the comments and the competitiveness and make it personal. This was about a team. This was about winning. This was about becoming a man and not being a boy and thinking about the here and now, but seeing the big picture. Um, and I remember as I started to get that and our, and then like it, it, our relationship began to blossom. And now when I go back to Georgia and I see him, it's just, it's so cool, uh, to see coach Bobo now even having, you know, cause like one of my earliest thoughts was he, he, he yelled at me in a match drill. He sent me back. And, and this was a messed up day because I was in the, I was in the line after Malcolm. And Coach Bobo loved Malcolm Mitchell. Loved, him. <laughs> loved, loved him. Malcolm. Yeah, yeah. Malcolm's like Coach Bobo's son. And then I was like the redheaded stepchild because we were both the receivers coming into that class. And so he like sends Malcolm's group through. And he's like, that's a great rep, Malcolm. I, we do our mat. I'm going through there. Do it. We hit our, hit our chest. We run up. And he's like, bang your knees, Conley. Bang your knees. And he sends us back. And he goes, you're not AJ. 
And I was like, I almost turned around and I was like, ooh. <laughs> but like, honestly, he prepared me for uh, the league. He prepared me for the league and in a way uh, where I can be a ruthless competitor now. And I am more concerned about making my team better and being respected for my play on the field than making friends. And mm -hmm. I think that that is vital. If you want any sort of longevity in this league, you have to prioritize what's important. What are you there for? What is your job? How do you, how does this team, cause it's a business, how does this team view you and your part in this whole process? What cog are you and what should you be doing? And everything else is, is extracurricular. Um, and so, you know, in the league, I, I viewed it that way. And I, I had even more coaches when I got to the league that were just like Coach Bobo. I had, uh, when I got to Kansas City, I had Eric Bieniemy, and And you hear things that people say about him. He's one of my favorite coaches that I've played for. And I don't think I would have that perspective if it, was, if it wasn't for Coach Bobo. Everything that he said, everything that he, he does as a coach is because he wants the man in front of him to succeed because he can't play anymore. You know, when he played, he was that ruthless competitor. And now he finds any way to physically and mentally push the players around him. And I appreciate that because it's made me better. It's made me, it's made me push past places that I thought were my limit multiple times. And uh, I think that that's really affected my career. So I'm 100%, I'm you know, my first initial thoughts of Bobo are not the way that I think of him now. And I um, enjoy any time that I see him or his family um, and I'm thankful for that, you know, all of those, all those times that he pushed my buttons and he really like grew uh, my patience and he grew my, my ability to say, you know, it's not that serious. It's not that serious. It's not personal. Like find, find your zone. Weed through all the noise and continue attacking. That's what he was looking for. Chris, and, and, and you know, I'd love for you to comment on this because one thing that I, respected the most out of coach Bobo towards the end of it was obviously his football IQ is very high nose ball no doubt but you kind of hinted at it about like you know hey you're not AJ right he knew how to push you a little bit his emotional EQ was much higher than I think people give him credit for one thing that I always valued out of coach or out, of, out of Mike Bobo was he knew how to like create a very cohesive unit within the offense, right? Like, Hey, uh, lay it on the line for your brother or it, you know, do your job for the man next to you. It's like, understand what you're doing so you can kind of form a team within a team. And I, I always thought that, you know, particularly 2013, when we had a ton of injuries and Chris, you, there, there were probably games where you and I were playing like 60, 65 snaps because we were, our numbers were so low. But even then, no matter if Gurley was down or Marshall was down, or we had, you know, uh, Karempolis in there toting the rock, right? Shout out Karempolis, great player, uh, walk on kid, but, you know, Todd Gurley's Todd Gurley. Mike Bobo always had an ability to get us ready to play as a cohesive unit, no matter who was up or who was down. I'm not talking about the collective team. I can't speak for the defense, especially, but for those offensive teams that we're a part of, particularly 11, 12, and 13, Chris, you probably could say the same for 14 with Hudson as QB. But I always thought that was one of his like underappreciated gifts was being able to get all the guys ready, no matter the talent level that we had. We probably didn't have, we weren't as talented as some teams, but I'd love for you to kind of add on to that if you could about that kind of coach his ability to form a team within a team. Yeah, I think that, um, like you said, Coach Bobo is a master at pushing the buttons that you didn't know were there. Totally. Um, and he could push different buttons for different guys. And I think probably that's one of the things that I was frustrated about. I was like, why didn't you say the same thing you said to me to someone else? Because that's not their button. They don't care about that, but right. he knew I did. He knew that I, that was my pride and that's what he attacked. And that was the way that he could get me off of my game. And he did that with different guys in different ways. He knew that pushing my buttons wasn't making me run more reps. I would gladly run, you know, more at practice. Like that wasn't, that didn't bother me. And that's, so that's not how he came, you know, for me. And he did that for other guys. But I think that 
he knew that in that league that if you didn't have an offense that had a killer mindset, your team didn't your team didn't have a chance to win. You know, early, um, I think right right when I was coming in to Georgia, you know, the SEC was known for these big, hard hitting, you know, the dominant Alabama on defense. And the way that we operated as an offense was like we were the we were the badasses. <laughs> we were the gunslingers. Mm-hmm. And I think that it was really like over time and, and practicing and, and being around and understanding what the standard of work is, everyone kind of eventually became Coach Bobo in terms of the mindset of we need to go out here and we need to step on these guys' throats. And step that's kind of how, that's how we were. We would say that to each other and you could look around the huddle out there and you could see it in everyone's eyes. You know, at that moment, mm-hmm. It's like the roaring stands in that stadium. You couldn't hear any of it. It was one, yeah, yeah. you couldn't see anything outside of the lines. And I feel like that was like the first time that I really understood like, yo, this is what a, this is when, when offense is in, they call it the zone. Mm-hmm. Some people call it flow state. Uh, yeah. When we were in, when we were in those places, those were the games where we put up numbers and it didn't matter if the, the other offense on the other side was doing it. We knew we were gonna go out there and do it again. And it yeah. could be anyone. Uh, like you said, um, he he really had us practicing to the point where if a guy went down and the third or the fourth guy went in, that guy ate. I remember when when guys who weren't the starters or who are a walk on got their shot and they went out there, they didn't they didn't miss a beat. And to people, mm-hmm. you know, in the media, they'd be like, oh, this guy played so well. But we knew they belonged mm-hmm. because they had gone through everything that we had gone through and they were just as prepared and they were just waiting for their moment. And when it came, they took advantage of it. And, you know, every time I see see the guys, you know, I, I'm just so proud of everything that we went through together and the way that we stood together during those games. Some of the some of the best memories I have of playing the game. Yeah, you, you talk about that that flow state, and that just made me think of, you know, not worrying about what the other offense is doing. That reminds me of the LSU game when y'all went shot for shot with Zach Mettenberger, Aaron, when those two were, were just going absolutely off. The defense is not much of it during that game and ended up walking away with a, one of the best wins in, in Sanford Stadium history. Um, that just reminds me of that. Chris, I do I do got to get your perspective for this. Just I'm curious because I've heard Aaron's take on it. I've heard Arthur's, um, Malcolm Mitchell's, a, a lot of those guys. And uh, I want to get yours because you I think you have a, maybe the best perspective other than Aaron is the – that final play in, in 2012, not to bring up any any bad memories um, for you on purpose, but can you can you take this through that play in your perspective? I, I think that, you know, before I even talk about the play, you know, a lot of people, when they bring that up, they apologize. Uh, but at this point in my life, uh, I am I have such a different perspective on that game, on that moment, on the game of football as a whole that it doesn't it doesn't make me upset you know talking about it there are people like trolls will be trolls you know when you're a kid you're 19 you're 20 years old and trolls come at you uh you react with emotion you react in this way that says oh you can't talk to me like that i've i've been dedicating my body and my life at giving everything that i can to this game and i came up short you know and you make it personal um but like, that's not the perspective that I have now. I have so much more perspective. I'm thankful for all the moments that have made me into the player that I am today. That moment has reinforced me because if I wasn't, if I didn't have that moment, my career wouldn't have made it to the point that it's at now. Um, you know, so I think that um, specifically about that play uh, from that game, you know, it was, it was a little bit of a blur. Um, as you guys know, the ball wasn't coming to me uh, and it got tipped at the line. And it was kind of just like one of those moments where you like turn around, you have no idea what's going on and it's just right there in your hands. And, um, you know, I think that now uh, having played professional football, you realize the tiers and the levels that there are uh, to the mental approach to the game. Uh, My football IQ now as a professional player is a lot higher because this is my day job. I spend you know, during the season and before the season, I spend pretty much all day, you know, the time that people spend at their nine to five, I'm spending doing football. So it's a lot easier to reinforce habits, rules, and there's a lot of uh, probability and 
well, you should catch the ball in this situation. This situation, you shouldn't. You should go out of bounds in this situation. This in this situation, you should go backwards and get and get tackled inbounds. Like, there's a lot of uh, nuance to the game that you don't really understand in college. And in that moment, I just did what was natural and what I what it happened. You know, I ca- I caught the ball and went down. wasn't really sure how close I was to to the goal line, and also wasn't really sure with how much time was left on the clock. Uh, and then, you know, the confetti just comes down and, and everything in you is kind of just crushed, mm-hmm. you know, in that moment. You just see the looks on your teammates' faces. That was the biggest thing that I was concerned with and worried about. You know, I wanted to win for my guys. You know, I wanted it for the seniors. I wanted it for all of the UGA, you know, alum that came before us and gave us that opportunity. You know, it wasn't about me um, in that moment. It was about, you know, letting people that you you really want to do things for letting them down. Uh, but I, I think that as time has gone on, you realize that there are, you know, a lot of things that affect football games, a lot of moments to win football games, a lot of things that lose football games. And uh, if that's one play uh, that I have to own uh, and it's part of my story, I'll own it because I can, you know, at this point in my career, I realize like that these things like, in order to play a sport like this, you got to be, you got to be a gladiator. You got to be a Viking. You got to be willing to put your ego. You got to be able to put your body and your mind on the line and literally put it out there in front of millions of people, not knowing how it's going to go, not knowing if you're going to make every play, not knowing if the guy across from you is going to make an amazing play, knowing that if it doesn't go your way, all those millions of people are going to make judgments on your character and your life. You know, that is a, that is something that you have to come to grips with and be willing to do. Like, that's a lot, especially for like a young kid. But in those moments, you learn a lot about yourself and you realize that, man, like I, I didn't, I didn't succeed, but you realize that it's about how you get up because some people just stay down there. And, uh, in those moments, I feel like I, I grew a lot. I had like tough lessons to learn things to grapple with. But I'm thankful for the experiences because it shapes the way that I view the game and things on and off the field now. Any sort of failure, any sort of obstacle, uh, it's it's shaped the way that I view those things and the way that I continue to attack them because I don't remain down. Well, um, I think that's an outstanding perspective first. And I'm curious, it really makes me think how much how much does your faith play into that perspective? A A ton. You know, I think that when I struggled with those things the most, you know, not making the play or or having having the moment where the game was so close and and it didn't happen. I think that when you begin to question yourself, you're having you're you're having an error in perspective Um, for me, especially at this point in my career. It's a lot easier for me to say I am not football at that point when you're in college and you know, the the world recognizes your face and they know your name because your team and this and that, you're kind of reaching a level of fame that you just never experienced, well, me personally never experienced before. And so you begin to conflate your identity with football and you start seeing them as one and the same. And uh, that really puts you in situations where you, where when success doesn't come, you think that it's a reflection of you as a person and uh, not just your work. And um, I think that, you know, my faith has grown so much throughout the game because you have all of these instances where you trust God and you say, hey, you know what, God, I am your son. I am loved. I am all the things that God says about you. But then as soon as life hits you in the face, in the public eye, you run back to the, well, I'm not that, I'm this. And I think that over time you begin to realize, uh, I've realized that, you know, God is faithful and regardless of how I play on a Sunday, he loves me just the same. And that's freeing to a point where I don't play the game of football out of fear. I used to play out of fear. It used to be a fear of like, I I don't want to lose. Like I'm out here doing everything in my power not to lose instead of playing in a place of, from a place of joy and saying like, yo, I've been given this opportunity. There's, cause there's a lot of pressure, you know, you're playing at Georgia. It's a, it's a historic, uh, every game is historic. Every team you play gives you their best shot. Every game is talked about uh, as, a, as, a, as your downfall. You know, there's a lot of pressure 
out there. And if you look at it the wrong way, you allow that pressure to drive you. And pressure is not as good of a, as a motivator as love, you know? And so I think that at this point, I, I've really just decided to look at the game in a different way and say, you know what, Lord, thank you for the opportunity to play this game. Thank you for the opportunity to be around these people in a locker room and to be a positive force. You know, a football season's long. An NFL football season is longer. And that is a lot of time that you're spending around these guys in a lot of really uncomfortable situations where you're dead tired and life happens. And I'm just thankful for the opportunity that I can be a positivity. I can be a light in someone's life. I can share the gospel with just the way that I am and how how I love on other guys and pick them up because everything in the world <laughs> is trying to beat them down. And so um, that, that right there, it's, it's a much more effective motivator. It's a, it's a much more uh, effective way of, of really viewing the game and, and it makes it easier for myself when, when things don't go right because that's just a guarantee in this game, you know, that, that everything's not gonna go right. I absolutely love that perspective. Artie, do you have anything on that before we get into uh, NFL? No, I just think, you know, when you think of what, when I think about Chris and, and, and the relationships I've been able to build with, with players, uh, teammates of mine from college, like Chris has always been confident in himself and who he was and, and, and has always uh, presented himself in, 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 a, in a confident and strong manner. And I've always been uh, envious of you for that because you, you know, much like your parents and your mom, who I, who I have a soft spot for, it's just like, just, you know, you're, you're an exceptional human being. And uh, I've always thought highly of you as a person. And, you know, beyond the football stuff, like I, like I started out this podcast with, you know, um, I just always, uh, always saw you in a different light because of your ability to think a certain way and be confident in the way of, of, of your thinking. And, uh, you know, it doesn't surprise me that you've been able to find peace and strength through your faith. Right. But you, but for my, for my, uh, if my memory serves me correctly, you've been that way for a long time. So none of this surprised me, but it still, it still brings me, uh, a lot of joy and warmth in my heart to know it's still, it's still guiding you in, in, in such a strong way. Yeah, man, I, I appreciate that. Like, uh, it definitely hasn't always been like this. Um, I think that, you know, a way that I like to describe it is that whatever is inside your cup is what comes out when it's shaken. You know, um, you can, you can tell yourself what's in it, but until you actually know, until you've actually been shaken, you don't really know. Uh, and, uh, you know, I've had some seasons, um, playing the game professionally where that was tested and, you know, and, and it was, uh, it was rough and it was a lot of stuff, you know, going through off the field, a lot of stuff going through on the field, in the locker room, a lot, of, a lot of things that, you know, people will just never hear about. But in those situations, you know, uh, thank God I, I learned so much. I almost, I almost didn't make it. I almost retired, but it was, it was lessons that were being taught to me and, um, you know, at this point now, you know, I, I wouldn't change those things because at this point they've, they've really informed, they've even further informed my view and the fact that I believe that, you know, God is writing my story. You know, he, he's allowed those things to happen along with all the beautiful and wonderful things as well. Well, that, that story welcomed a new chapter today, right, Chris? And folks are probably listening to this a few days after, uh, but breaking news today, Chris signed with the 49ers, another one year deal here. Um, congratulations are in order for you. I know we already shared that before a call, Chris. Uh, but I just wanted to ask you about that, man. Uh, what, what went into that? Um, what were your expectations after the Super Bowl appearance for you? Um, and you know, you know, what, what does the team expect from you as well, just as, as a player? Um, yeah, you know, I, I'm really excited to uh, head back to Santa Clara and, uh, to be on that team. You know, that, that was such a unique locker room. I haven't been, you know, I've been, I've played in a number of places. I think I've played in uh, four, I think I've played for five teams um, at this point. Um, and of those five teams, only two have had locker rooms that I felt like the guys 
were really in it for each other, like 100% committed and in it for each other, like willing to go and like push themselves to the point of exhaustion and sickness for the guy next to him. And uh, San Fran was one of those places. And I just, I was uh, so enamored with that because that's kind of the way that I approach the game. And in many of the places that I've played, it has been seen as an anomaly. It's been seen as uh, exceptional, where in San Francisco, it's seen as optimal. It's seen as the norm. It's seen as the minimum. This is what we do. And uh, I, I, it just revitalized me, man. You know, I was playing, I, I went there last year, uh, my ninth season in the year uh, in the league. And uh, I, I went there knowing that they had incumbent starters. You know, that was one of the things that they told me. Believe it or not, uh, last year in free agency, the only team that called me and gave me a deal was San Francisco. Uh, and everyone else was like, yeah, that guy's old. He can't play. Um, but um, they gave me a shot and they told me like, hey, dude, it's an uphill battle. We already have people at every position who play them and they play them well. Uh, but we, we see something in your tenacity. We've always been a fan of that. We've tried to get you here multiple times earlier in your career, and this is our shot. Like, let's go do this thing. And uh, welcomed me into the fold, uh, allowed me to compete, but then also I feel like there was a tremendous amount of respect. There's a lot of vets, veterans in in, uh, San Francisco, and uh, the respect that they have for guys who have been around for a long time is refreshing. Because there are some teams that go out of their way to find, you know, the eight, seventh year player and then just like treat them like they're a child uh so it's just nice to be around a, an organization that values us values our families uh realizes that we're older and that we have families because some teams don't really have a lot of that um and so that was refreshing but as for what the team um uh is expecting for me uh, they're expecting more of that competition they're expecting more of that standard um that i bring every day and um Really, the uh, I think one of the th- cool things that I was able to do in San Francisco, you know, the first uh, six weeks, uh, six or seven weeks that I was with San Francisco, I was on their practice squad. So really, I was just out there uh, practicing with these guys, running all the drills with them, taking reps in practice with the with the first offense and everything. And then we would get to Sunday when we would travel with the teams, be in all the meetings and everything. And then we would get to Sunday and I just I couldn't suit up. like I wasn't allowed to put pads on. And so those first seven weeks, obviously, they, yeah, they were a struggle because, you know, the, impe- the competitor in you just wants to go and wants to go because you're doing everything that everyone else is doing. And then you get to the fun part and you can't do anything. Um, but in that moment, I, I tried to, to refocus and say, hey, what can I be doing? What can I contribute? How can I make my presence felt on the field? And uh, really, it just comes down to the same stuff, you know, that we talked about before, those interpersonal relationships and uh, getting to know guys to the point where, they trust you enough to let you push them. And I think that that's one of the cool things that I was able to do last year is with guys, whether it was guys on offense, uh, guys on in the receiver room specifically, other positions, guys on special teams, and even guys on defense, I was able to uh, gain that respect because they saw the way that I, you know, came to work every day, the way, the grind that I was on and they they saw that and then i was able to like take their game and say hey like you need to keep up with me like at this point it should not be about like I, like you wanting to slow down like i'm 4 years older than you you should up your game get to my level and i think that at that point there was a level of respect uh that some of these guys have for me and i was able to really like just you know continue to push continue to push and, and, and fight for that consistency because that's something that I didn't figure out uh, until a couple of years into my career. And there were, uh, there were guys who were doing the same thing for me, who were pushing me and saying, hey, I'm this much older than you. I shouldn't be lapping you when it comes to this. You need to get on my level. That's the standard. And uh, so I'm just emulating what other guys did to me when I came in the league and guys that I uh, attribute to the as the, they're the reasons that I've been able to play as long as I have. Um, so just trying to be that for other people. But I think that this next year, I think we'll bring some more opportunity. Um, you know, I'm going in with the same mindset that I go in every year that I'm going to go in there and win a starting job. You know, we have incumbent starters again. 
but that doesn't change my mindset. It doesn't change the way that I work. I report to OTAs. I report to training camp with the mindset of I'm going out here to take your job. And they know that every single one of the guys, Debo, BA, Jawan, all the guys in that room know that, but they are competitors to the point where they say, I'm not going to let you. And that's the way that they work. And that's why we, that's how we push each other. So, um, what do I expect from the season? More competition. And I am uh, so excited to get back to that because that is a, an identity that not everyone has. So, so Chris, you got some Bulldogs going through the NFL draft process right now. And, you know, just preparing for this conversation, ran across those crazy combine numbers you put up. So we got a 4 3 5 40, 45 inch vert. You're like six two or so, yep. and that and that verts of NFL record still today. It's just absolutely incredible, and it made me think of how that draft process might have changed for you after you posted those numbers, right? Oh, it definitely did. <laughs> right. What take us through? What was that like? Um, it was frustrating at first. I feel like um, initially I felt like I had played well enough to be in the conversation with, you know, some other, some of these other guys who were, who were getting all, all of this attention. And I, you know, obviously you understand that some of these guys are exceptional talents, but uh, at first I remember when my senior year concluded, I didn't have an invite to the combine and I felt like my career as a whole um, and maybe not just my senior year, cause my senior year numbers were different. I felt like my career as a whole had justified me getting an invite to the combine and I didn't get mine until super, super late, but I got it. But I, you know, I was just, uh, had this chip on my shoulder and I was just training and I was just like, Oh, like if they don't, they don't recognize it now, they're going to see it later kind of thing. Uh, but that, uh, once I got that invite, you know, just a, a huge sigh of relief. Um, cause I was about to go into, you know, your pre combine training. A lot of guys go, away to these facilities where they're there for two months and it's like intense regimen of sleep and and intense nutrition and intense working out and all this like really meticulous body comp stuff because you know the league is such a measurements league um and so like you know we were going into that and uh i just remember like at that point the relief and just being so thankful for the fact that I was in, I was just like, yo, I'm going to go all in on this training. I'm getting everything out of it that I can. You know, there were guys uh, I remember at the facility who were like, man, this is kind of ridiculous. This is a lot. And I was like, nah, man, I'm going to eat this stuff up. Like every single, every single little advantage I can get, I'm going to get it. And um, believe it or not, we were uh, training for our forties. I trained at Exos Pensacola and uh, our speed coach went through this exercise on the first day that we were training for our 40s and he said hey you need to be so comfortable when you step out there on that line that when you run your 40 you're completely relaxed so you run your best time and so the way we would start is by visualizing your 40 and you had to visualize everything from the start to the finish to the time on the monitor to the time and people's uh stopwatches in their hands and he asked everyone you know what their what their time they were envisioning on the on the laser uh prompter was and i told him four three five he laughed <laughs> and uh and i'll never forget after the combine him running through the ho the lobby of the train station with his hands out like this and was like four three five four three five but um after that day you know i i feel like uh, i heard i i don't know you know, I didn't have all my draft reports, but I I heard that my draft stock went from a six round pick to a, a third round pick, you know, and I was picked in the third. So uh, those numbers definitely helped 100 percent. That's that's crazy. I think a lot of Georgia fans don't even know that you go from not having an invite at first to a third round pick. I mean, those guys in the three rounds, maybe first four rounds that we think guys that are getting combine invites. So that's yeah. that's an incredible story, man. That is absolutely awesome. I mean, preparing yourself for such a big event and having that pressure on you, but then still performing. That's what I appreciate just knowing what the guys go through to, for that moment and then showing out. That's what I, me and Arthur had a whole episode dedicated to these guys that went to Indianapolis. And of course he, Arthur was in it as well and, and gave us some insight there. Um, 
what what one is one piece of advice you would give these guys? And Georgia has thirteen guys eligible that have declared this year. Um, what advice would you have? And we'll end it on this: them going into the draft now, after those process, after the pro day, and then right when you get selected. If you had to go back and change anything that you did, or maybe a mindset, anything like that. Um, headed in, you know, your first NFL team and, and that pressure on your shoulders there. Yeah, you know, um, I, I feel like a lot of people can get twisted what it is that you're walking into uh, when you're getting drafted and you're going to a team. You know, it's this exciting time and this moment that you've dreamt about your whole life. But really, that is the beginning of the longest year of your life. You know, you're going straight from your season, senior season of football straight to these facilities to train for your combine and your pro day, straight to another team, straight to all of these meetings where you're going to be kept up at ridiculous hours in the night to learn these massive playbooks and concepts that are, you know, four or five times more extensive than anything you've learned to this point. And it's all about the product. It's not about how much they like you or, or how cool you are or how you fit in. It is about production. It is a production business. And I think that you're going to meet people. Uh, you're gonna meet vets who are like me, who really want to take time to recognize the individual and to uh, you know build people up. But letting, I, I, I just advise people to realize even more than you know, you know, you think you know, but until you see the business of the NFL, you don't understand how much of a business it is and how you're just a piece of that. So go into it with that mindset of like, hey, it is, it is a production-based business. That is, what have you done for me lately? So go into it and say, hey, if you're gonna capitalize on the opportunity to play in this game, you know, at this level, don't hold anything back. If anything, this should, you should double down on the mindset of work now, play later. Invest everything that you can into the opportunity you know, of playing the game at this point. And hopefully you stick because, you know, the average career in the league is three years. So as soon as you walk in the door, they're looking for every reason to get rid of you. So what reason can you give them that says, I can't get rid of this guy. He has to be here. And if you can continue to develop yourself and to push yourself and to prove that you're, you're indispensable, then that's what, that's what keeps you around. Obviously don't be, you know, a jerk or anything about that, but like, be selfish about that. Be selfish about the way that you prepare. Be selfish about the standard at which you want yourself to play and then go out there and, and, and go take that. Go take that. The teams that, that are gonna give you a shot, they believe in you and they see something in you, but you really gotta go get it out because it's not gonna be there, you know, right when you get there. You know, I think you see now a lot of these uh, rookie players are coming out with this phenomenal talent. And uh, I think that I'll be one of the first people to say that I think that players that are coming out now are more physically gifted than we were, you know, when we were coming out. These guys are faster, taller, they jump higher, and they're just overall these, these freakish, and you know, they said it about me when I was coming out, these freakish athletes, but they're even more of a freak than I am, you know, and, uh, I just, I've seen a lot of rookies rest on that freakish talent and it kind of hit them out of nowhere that that isn't enough here. Everyone is talent. Everyone who is in the league was BMOC, was the big man on campus. Every single one was a dog and could freaking go out their best player on the field. And so that freakish ability isn't enough. And I think it is, it's enough to see the field, but it's, it's not enough to keep you there. So um, I would just advise, you know, these players to that same hunger and fervor that you went to Georgia with and that you, you learned those lessons to push yourself past your boundaries, get ready for another set of those. Get your mind right for another, another metamorphosis where you're going to have to rise above some things. And if you can do that and keep your mind uh, and your eyes focused on the right things, good things will happen. And I'm excited to see that because I, I feel like every conversation I have with people in the league, I champion every single dog, um, you know, that I come across because I know where they went. 
Dude, that, that's great advice. We need to clip this out for high school coaches and college coaches, prospective athletes going into the league, man. That's some great advice, it sounds like. Um, Artie, I'm going to end it with you, brother. Do you have anything to add on that? Yeah, no, I think Chris, Chris hit the nail on the head. Um, and, you know, we already went over some of his combine, combine stats. But if, if, so, if Chris, who's got the record of the combine, is telling people that the guys are jumping higher, running faster, who are coming out now, then you know these are some dudes out there. But I think one thing that if I could go back and do it all over again, the, the one thing I would change is what Chris was saying, and that was be a little bit more selfish in your process. Not selfish as like I'm a me guy, but being like, hey, it is every man for himself when it comes to fighting for a spot, right? Because that's the unique thing about the NFL is they're trying to team build while they're also trying to wean guys off to get to that final 53. And I think that's why general managers and player personnel guys probably get underpaid because it's such a unique dynamic, right? It's not 85 scholarships with 25 walk-ons. It's 53 guys who I think it starts at 90. 96. 96 and then yeah. you know and then, and then 11 practice squad dudes mm. and i when i first got there broke my back two two days in so i was just like trying to learn trying to get healthy and then when i finally did get healthy i like almost forgot how to compete right because i was like i was now a second year guy had friends in the team and almost forgot I'm like i i'm basically a rookie again i need to like zero in and fight, scratch, claw to try to get an extra rep on punt or a, a, an extra rep in the wedge or learn how to play fullback or teach myself how to long snap because I had I used to do that in high school. And what Chris is saying is be a team guy, be willing to work with your teammates and be dependable and be, you know, obviously work incredibly hard and, and – allow yourself to be trusted by your coaches and teammates, but at the same time, show up every day and be like, nah, like I'm getting one of these 53 spots. Like, I love you, dude. I'll send you a, I'll send you a Christmas card to my family. I'll invite you to my wedding, but I'll also make sure you get fired so I can be the fourth wide receiver or, or in my case, the third tight end or the, the tight end that can also long snap. Right. And it's a mindset, and I and I think you gotta. It's so easy, no matter where you, to think that like, oh, I'm just gonna make the team because I did X before here, right? One thing I always appreciate appreciate about Jarvis Landry, who, who I know Chris Chris knows, and that Jarvis played about ten years in the league. He we got drafted the same year, in Miami. Jarvis like I'll play gunner. Jarvis like you know I'll I'll go be scout team whatever, right? And I think he got 100 balls his rookie year, but Jarvis Jarvis had that like hungry mentality from day one. Chris has that hungry mentality from day one, and it's if you lose it even for a second, someone who is chomping at the bits right behind you to come get it, and it's it's a ruthless game. It's a ruthless game. Yeah, you're on a you are on. I think of it this way, uh, Coach. When I came in, always said. Hey, if you are not a guy who is willing to take food off the man next to you's table, mm -hmm. if you are not willing to take food out of that guy's mouth, you will not make it. 100%. You are taking food out of his kid's mouth. No, there is no mistake about it. That is what you are here for. They overbook. You're on a flight that's overbooked. There are 53 mm -hmm. seats and there are almost 100 people in the room. This room will be half of the people that it is right now. And if you can't have that person, don't be enamored with the friendships and be like, oh, like my buddy who played at Ole Miss is with me now. Like, no, don't be enamored at that because you guys are in a uh, last man standing business and you have to be willing to go out there and take someone's job because that's the only way you're getting it. You're taking someone who is an incumbent player. You're taking their job. Short story. In my second year in the league, I was practice squad for the Broncos. We started the year seven and zero. It was the year they ended up winning the we ended up winning the Super Bowl in 2014-15. But we're seven and zero. So you would think that if you're seven and zero, eight and zero in the NFL, this is a team that won the Super Bowl. Like, why mess with the continuity of that team, right? But every Tuesday morning, I think it was, 
or Monday morning, I forgot the day, we'd be out there and you would see about 30 guys, right? Kickers, quarterbacks, tight ends, receivers, defensive ends, linebackers, didn't matter, about 30 dudes. Some would be eight-year vets, some would be rookies. They were they were coming in and getting worked out, right? And it didn't matter. We were set, we were 7-0, 8-0, a team that ended up winning the Super Bowl. And what I'm trying to tell you is I'm sure Chris experienced it even this year to this day on a team that was in the Super Bowl. These coaches, player personnel are constantly evaluating talent that's not on their team. So they can be like, oh, well, this guy can maybe do this thing a little bit better than who we got on the team now who might be able to help us week 16, 17, or in the first or second round of the playoffs. And that's how it is, right? It doesn't matter if you're 8-0 and or 0-8. and You're constantly getting evaluated, and they're constantly bringing in fresh blood to see if they're better than you. Oh, that's a few things we learned today, guys. And mentality, hard work, and some faith get you a long way. And if you're young listening to this as well, I think that's just some great life advice as a human being, first off. Uh, but Chris, I, I can't thank you enough for coming on, spending probably a lot more time than you had planned to. So I apologize for going over, but it was great to have you both on too um, and hear about your relationship, learn a lot more about you. And congratulations again, signing with the 49ers. I know Dog Nation was all over Twitter watching you in the Super Bowl. We hope to see you there again next year. Uh, but until then, hopefully we can have you back sometime. Go Dogs. We appreciate it, guys. Go Dogs, man. Appreciate hey, Chris, you guys having me. Chris, I just want to say this. I told Keith last time he was on. I love you, brother. I'm so proud of you. And, uh, you know, some of the best memories I had uh, in college was the relationships I was able to make with guys my age, older than me, younger than me. And you and your family hold a special place in my heart. So I love you, brother. I'm going to be following you again next year. Congratulations on the family, the growing family. And uh, I hope for more prosperity and, and good fortune for you guys moving forward. Love you too, brother, man. That means a lot.